Good evening. I'd like to welcome you to the City Council meeting of May 5th, Cinco de Mayo Day, 2014. If you stand with me for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Ah, thank you. I'll call on the clerk to, or acting clerk, or uh, read, read the roll, please. Uh, acting clerk. Okay. Councilmember Schwab? Here. Councilmember Hall? Here. Councilmember Altal? Here. Councilmember Ellison? Here. And Mayor Hodges? Here. Uh, next item is the agenda. Any additions, corrections, or changes to the agenda? I move that we approve the agenda as presented. I will support. Second. Second. I've been moved and seconded to uh, approve the minutes of, or the agenda. Uh, all in favor? Yes. 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 Opposed? Okay. Then uh, approval of the minutes of our regular meeting of April 21st. Those are in the packet for our consideration. Any additions or corrections there? I move that we approve the minutes of the previous meeting, April 21st. This time, I will second. All right, thank you. I move and second to approve the minutes of the regular meeting, April 21st. All in favor? Yes. yes. Any opposed? We had a workshop and then uh, the following week on April 28th, and there's a uh, listing of the minutes of that particular meeting and what transpired. Any additions, corrections there? I move that we approve the work, sh work session meeting minutes of April 28th. And I will second. I move and second to approve the minutes of the work session of April 28th. All in favor? Yes. yes. Any opposed? All right. Moving on then to the approval of the accounts payable, the bills for the uh, last period. Any questions or concerns? Nope. I move that we have approved the accounts payable as presented. I'll second. I moved and seconded to approve the accounts payable, and for this we would require a roll call. So. Council Member Alto? Yes. Council Member Ellison? Yes. Council Member Hall? Yes. Council Member Schwab? Yes. And Mayor Hatches? Yes. Item five is citizen comments for any of the items that do not appear on our agenda. So if any citizen would like to address the council, this would be the time to step up to the podium. Seeing none, then we'll move on to item six, some old business, so specifically the strategic plan and Mr. Howe. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, several items to report on the strategic goals report. Uh, info and infiltration, find a new office preparing proposals for the station upgrade for a review and discussion. And I think I mentioned this at our workshop, uh, but I'll mention it again tonight that they're calculating whether or not it's more cost effective to actually um, put in a new lift station and eliminate part of the force main and move the lift, lift station. So they're doing sort of a cost benefit analysis of, of that as opposed to upgrading the lift station. And um, so that will be coming. Facility improvement plans, Dan Desjardins submitted the updated plans, which we'll try to incorporate into your budget document. Uh, utility improvement plans, they've been updated and, and already incorporated in the budget document. Community cleanup project, uh, Valley Vista Trailer Park cleanup project is tentatively scheduled for June 28 and June, July 29. And uh, Chief Buchel is working with Federal River Outreach Ministries to shore up equipment and volunteers. Uh, pilot leak disposal project, we've been um, talking with some other communities. Most seem to use the leaf brick bag program similar to all. Uh, one does a fall vacuum leaf pickup with their own equipment, and another has a designated drop off on Saturdays. So we're going to try to learn a little bit more about what some of the other communities are doing and we'll be bringing that back to you, but did want to report that we had made some phone calls and got that information. Uh, rental rehab, that's an item on your agenda. And downtown development plan, the kickoff meeting is tentatively being scheduled for May 30th. Uh, rec plan update, our interns been active updating the demographic information in the plan, which will be presented as a draft for review of the next Park and Recreation Committee meeting. State show up plan, public input has been collected with the plans narrowed down to two versions that will be presented for, to the stakeholders for input. And downtown core trail connector, we coordinated with Grand Valley Metro Council to have 
the River Valley Trail projects, uh, including the connector through Lowell, included in their non-motorized plan. And what that means is it sets us up for the potential <coughs> federal funding that would help with uh, with trails. And I know I went through all of those very quickly, but uh, if you have any questions, we have to answer them. Any questions? Things happening. Yes. All right. Moving on to the uh, budget for 2014-15 as proposed and or being uh, discussed here. So, Mr. Howell. We, uh, during your last meeting, I presented you with recommendations and uh, one of those recommendations of the workshop. Um, if you have any questions um, today or anything that you want me to research, um, feel free to let me know that. And one of the things that we should talk about, because you have limited discussion time during your workshop, um, is whether or not you feel that like we need to uh, schedule another workshop before your meeting two weeks from now, because you'll need to approve the budget two weeks from now. I would like one Another workshop? When would we uh, schedule that? Monday night is the Planning Commission. Um, Tuesday is uh, equally uh, all right. I'd have to check in my social work first. <laughs> yeah. It's possible, yeah. It's possible. Uh, for next week, Tuesday the 13th? I think that's fine. Uh, do that at uh, 6 o'clock? At 6? Six. Yeah. Six Tuesday the 13th at 6 o'clock? Tuesday the 13th, 6 o'clock. Do you want to schedule it? I'll try to remember that. <laughs> we'll call you. We'll, we'll call you at 6 o'clock. Okay, no. <laughs> Anything else uh, as far as the budget goes? Any questions or things we'll do, uh, uh, that we're looking for for the 13th that might be dealt with uh, so we'll have, have those answers? I think we we already talked about it, Martin Mills. Okay. So, okay. Well, I'm assuming we can call them if we have issues. Yeah, I mean, between now and then, especially if I, I know you wanted some street numbers, which I need to get to you. Um, and if there's anything else that you want before the workshop, please let me know before the workshop so I can gather that information together. Um, preferably before the end of the week and not Monday or Tuesday. Um, but Tuesday. I understand things come up the last week too. So if you have any questions, uh, let me know and I'll bring whatever you need to the workshop. Okay, good with the budget, all right? All right, moving on into item seven and uh, KDL, Captain District Library presentation. Lance, welcome. We have a couple guests with you. I do, and it's so wonderful to be here with you again. Um, it seems like I was just here, and it's always a pleasure to be with uh, our friends in Lowell. I'm here this evening with uh, Carol Simpson, our board member, who is sitting in for Charles Myers, and Josh Bernstein, who is your new Englehart branch head, who's been doing remarkable things, I'm glad to say. I'm also glad we didn't have to sandbag this year. I just want to throw that out there. And so, and I was kind of worried after the epic snowfall that we had. Um, speaking of EPIC, you'll notice in front of you, you have the EPIC Annual Report. We call it the EPIC Annual Report because we won the EPIC Award last year. We want to celebrate that a little bit for excellence in business from the Grand Rapids Chamber, beating Elzinga Volkers and Cascade Engineering. So we were pretty tickled about that. Um, I just saw a special uh, thing on Fred Keller in the Grand Rapids Business Journal, and uh, it reminded me again how special that was for us. And speaking of awards, we also just won the Linda E. Anderson Award for training all of our employees on CPR and first aid and installing AEDs in all branches and it's already paid off. We've saved three lives so far. So it's already paid for itself. Um, you can't put a, a value on that. And all three lives are children. So extremely, extremely important. Um, happy to report we've been extremely busy. Uh, our library services for the blind and physically handicapped have actually gone up 66% over this, this past year. We anticipate an even greater need going forward as the median age of the residents of Kent County is getting older and older. We want to be prepared and well positioned to deal with that. We did uh, over 47,000 CERCs in, in that uh, regard. We had 66,000 kids at our children's story times. Um, you hear the governor, again, I've said this before, and I don't mean to be redundant or cliche, but the governor talks about early literacy being important. Well, we've been doing early literacy before they even called it early literacy. 
We're still doing it and we're extremely successful at it and we will continue to do it. Um, we had 30,000 summer reading uh, partic 30, yeah, summer reading participants in our summer reading program in 2013, which is an astronomical number. It's four times larger than the nearest library in Michigan, the nearest person on the list. Um, it's actually one of the busiest summer reading programs in the entire Midwest, and we will continue to do that. Um, over half of the KDL branches uh, have had uh, computer training and job training available. And of course, we were the first library in Michigan to offer e-movies through Hoopla. Uh, again, we believe that convenience is king, and we need to meet our customers on their own terms. So finally, I'll kind of finish it off, letting you know that we did about 6.1 million certs, and one tenth of that amount was e-cert. Our e-cert numbers again continue to just go through, fly through the roof, um, and we're getting to the point where our demand for our materials is outpacing our ability to keep up. So. Very excited about that. KDL is always a leader, and we're always here to serve you. And with that, I will turn it over to Carol, and I'm sure she has a great presentation for you, and we're happy to entertain questions. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, Carol. Thank you. Thank you very much. Chuck uh, would have been here tonight, but he had family obligations. He's with them in Chicago. When you come to the library, usually you might be looking for a particular book or movie, um, magazine, uh, some particular information. And if you can't find it, um, all our staff are there to help you find an acceptable substitute. So I hope I'm an acceptable substitute tonight for Chuck. And I love coming to Lowell. I was telling the mayor, mayor that I was just here on Sunday at Larkin's for the dinner theater, and it was wonderful. Um, with Kent District Library having an epic year last year, it is amazing, absolutely amazing, when you consider that we did it on the same amount of money that we received in revenues in 2006. In the last couple of years, our revenues have been reduced. You know what it's like. It happened to you as well. $1.6 million. Uh, being smart about business and using business ideas and uh, has made a real difference and allowed us to still serve the public and meet their needs as much as we can. Um, along with that, it, um, we try our best to provide programming, materials, um, questions answered, and access to the library. Anywhere in the world, if you can access the internet, you can access Kent District Library. And we have a fabulous electronic collection, and people are using that a lot. Um, when we consider that, we would like to provide even more books, movies, music, and that's one of our goals. This is the 10th year of the 8800s mill that we have had throughout the uh, service area of Kent District Library. Um, with that 8800s mill and those smart business um, ideas, we've managed to keep serving the public while not increasing costs. However, we can't do that anymore. Uh, we've worked and discussed and uh, thought about things, and we do take and have decided to make an increase. There is a ballot proposal on the August 5th um, election day and we're seeking a rate of 1.28 mills and that is an increase for the average household owner taxpayer here in our service area about $30 which is one hardcover book and with that we've got wonderful plans we know that the population is aging. I'm an example. We all are. And with that, people are going to need the services of the library for the blind and the physically handicapped. 
and the services have increased greatly this year. Um, I think it was, let me check right here, 66% increase in services. And this is something that Kent District Library does that is unique. We service the region. No other library does that. We do for the counties of our region. And we hope to keep on doing that. Um, with our fiscal responsibility, we hope that we can also offer more computer classes, job training skills, and do it with technology upgrades. We've held the line. We've been able to really offer a lot of things electronically, but we've gotten to the point where we have to make some increases and hopefully serve you for another 10 years. Thank you, and I would like to introduce somebody that I know that you're well acquainted with, Josh your branch manager. Well, thanks again for having us, guys. Um, you've heard some of the great things that KDL as a, as a whole system is doing and, and what we've got our eye on, but um, I just wanted to let you know a couple of the highlights of the last year, um, just right here over the Engelhart branch. Um, as you know, um, 2013, one of the biggest changes is just a change in leadership of the branch that they took over towards the end of the year, last fall. Um, but in that short time, I've really noticed how uh, wonderful of a library we have. And there are a couple of highlights and things that I think really make, uh, make it such a special place to be. Um, one of those highlights in 2013 is definitely the community support and use of our branch. We have 80% uh, of the Lowell population that has a library card. So really, four out of five people you see walking down the street has a card and uses our library. That's the second highest within KDL. So um, as a whole, KDL is pretty great, but we are um, even one of the stronger branches. So it's something to be proud of. Um, and this means people of all ages and walks of life are in there every day. Um, we're helping them with their children, learning to read, finding fun activities, teaching them how to use the computer, helping them find jobs. Um, we've recently had a gentleman that I've helped a couple of times. He's about 85, 86, and he's been wanting to learn how to use his new Kindle. So he's been coming in a couple of days a week. Um, haven't seen him much last week or two, so I think he's finally got it, which is a good thing. Um, so those are the kind of things that, that we do and the kind of support we have from, from you guys in the community. Um, with that great community support comes great attendance at some of the events and some of the programs that we put on. Um, last year we had 4,758 attendees at events at the library, which was an 11% increase from the year before. And the year before was a 24% increase on the year before that. So it is growing. People are using us. I know a lot, of, a lot of people don't have the disposable income that they used to have, so they come to the events that we provide for them rather than maybe go out to a movie or something like that, or they download a free movie from us. Um, so but it, one of the highlights, I think, that we had in last year in programming was a uh, adult event, which it's notoriously hard to get adults without children to come to the library, but we had an author event. Jennifer Farr Davis, she wrote uh, a couple of books about her time hiking the Appalachian Trail. Um, she came in, I believe August, and talked about one of her books. We had over 75 adults come and enjoy it. Uh, such a popular thing that we will be doing another hiking uh, program this summer talking about hiking the uh, North County Trail, so, um, or North Country Trail, so that should be a good time. Uh, one other strength that I've certainly noticed that you guys are all well aware of with our branch is just our location. Um, we're close to this beautiful downtown, we're close to this gorgeous river, um, I would say my first five months there, while I'm aware that we're near a river, I had no idea how beautiful the setting was. It was just a frozen tundra, as most of the rest of the state is. But all of a sudden I can see it, and it is just amazing. I was able to walk down the street and see the steelhead jumping up at the, uh, at the dam, and it's, it's quite a beautiful look, location here. So that, that's a wonderful thing that we have going for us. Um, and finally, one of our highlights, or my highlights since I've been there, is just the great municip municipal support that we have at the library. I know some of you guys are library users and your families are, um, and that you're supportive of the library, but in addition to that, um, I, you know, I'm all, often working and communicating with Mark and have just started at the um, DPW and Chief Bukala, and um, pretty much everybody has been very supportive um, for whatever's coming up. Anytime we need help, whether it's a problem with the building or just, you know, we want to work on something interesting, um, it is amazing the support we have, so thanks to everybody. And I think that's it, unless there's any questions for us. Any questions for any of them? I really appreciate your uh, uh, one sheet that uh, they included uh, just on the statistical information for the Engelhart branch. Uh, that always helps to break it out. And all the others are 
very good libraries also <laughs> part of the system. Yes, we, we do have a favorite, so it, it is kind of nice to see those statistics. And, uh, Josh, again, welcome, and uh, thank you. very, very thank proud. You. I think it goes without question, we're all very proud of our library. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on then to item 7B, the Riverwalk Festival Fireworks Display. Liz is here. I'm Oh, Liz. I know she loves coming to the podium. <coughs> Love it. Liz Baker, Executive Director, Lowell Berry Chamber of Commerce. It's hard to believe it's getting close to Riverwalk. 20 years, too. That's an accomplishment. 20 years in downtown historical. Um, tonight, we are asking permission or for you to sign, I think the first thing is the um, fireworks permit. As you know, we uh, do the fireworks as an annual, become an annual event, and it's sponsored by the Laurels of Kent. Um, without them, we probably wouldn't be doing the fireworks. But we hold, or the fireworks are shot from Stony Lakeside Park. It's a very safe location. Um, that was a huge concern years ago when we first started doing it again. And so we just kept it in that area. And those would shoot off at 10:15 exactly sharp <laughs> on Saturday, July 12th. Okay. So we have a recommendation from the uh, city manager to approve uh, the uh, request of the Chamber of Commerce for fireworks. Do we have a motion? Make a motion. I'll second. Both in seconded. Now, is there any discussion, questions, or concerns? All in favor? Yes. yes. Any opposed? You got fireworks. All right. <laughs> One thing down. <coughs> Moving on to item C, the Riverwalk uh, Festival Street Closure request. Yes. Um, last year, um, we had asked for the same closures, I believe. Um, so what we're asking for, again, on Thursday, July 10th, we'd like to close Avery Street on this side for the concession area starting at 6 a.m. and then that won't open again until Saturday at about 6. And then on Saturday, we'd like to close Avery Street east of Monroe to the Nazarene parking lot and then north of Main Street on Washington to the school parking lot. Um, we've done it, I don't know, maybe two years now. And I think it's, it's all it's gone very well, and we have great help from the police department to get us through all these little snags. But it's worked very well, so we're asking for that again this year. I think that's no surprise to us. We're very familiar with that routine, and uh, it's worked out very well with the car show and all the other activities. Uh, so motion to uh, do this street closures. Motion. I support. And we'll move second to. Uh, <coughs> <laughs> Approve the street uh, closures. Uh, any uh, conversation or questions? Being none, all in favor? Yes. yes. Any opposed? You got a street close. All right. Thank you very much, and we look forward to hosting the 20th Annual Riverwalk Festival. Looking forward to it, Liz. Thank you. Item 7D Resolution Approving Acquisition of a Federal Foreclosed Property. It's a um, tax foreclosure, and uh, basically the process is, is is that when people don't pay their taxes, the, the county um, is responsible for collecting after a period of a couple of years. It goes through a process where it comes under what is called tax foreclosure. And then it um, eventually will get to a process where it is put up for bid and, and up for sale. However, before it gets to that process, the local municipality has the option of purchasing the property. And um, as these, these come up every year, the county sends us the list of parcels. Uh, typically, they're little pieces of residential parcels that um, really may not be of interest to us. But um, in this case, a, a parcel came up that may be of interest uh, to us. And so, um, and, and this just came up last week, and so I apologize that there wasn't time for a lot of discussion ahead of time. 
Um, but uh, this this person came up that uh, I thought would warrant some discussion with you at, at a council meeting. And, and uh, if you um, do approve the purchase, there's a resolution that's attached that the city attorney um, put together. Uh, the total amount would be for the outstanding um, taxes, which are $2,660.07. Um, the parcel, uh, we did not include a map, but Sue, if you want to switch over to number four for me, I've got at least the email um, version of it, and that screen probably shows up a little bit better, um, that Jeff had sent to me, Jeff Rash, our assessor, but this is Main Street and Bowles Road. This is actually where the construction is occurring on Bowles Road, right now, just in the Walgreens. And the parcel is this triangular parcel right along Bowles Road. Uh, city limits is this line and then continuing on up through uh, this easement in Bowles Road. And then this parcel back here is where there's a light and power substation. And um, we thought that this might be of some interest to us and maybe some future interest uh, for, from a power standpoint um, to at least own the parcel. Uh, so I thought I would bring it to you for your consideration and uh, if uh, you believe that uh, we should purchase the parcel, then we have to adopt the attached resolution. It looks like it's mostly frontage along Bowles Road. It is. It's all Bowles Road frontage. Seems like a good price. It, <laughs> it does. And Potential. <clears throat> somebody had mentioned that there was a rock on the corner at one time that depicted the uh, first settlement mm -hmm. of Dansville. Yep. And that uh, perhaps Maybe we move the rock back to this location because it says a quarter mile south, I think, on the placard, and now it's at Stony Lakeside Park, and so that first settlement is not a quarter mile south of Stony Lakeside Park. Mm -hmm. okay. wow. This is very close to where the rock was in the first place, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think it would be uh, nice to eventually get that back in the right location. Better location. Much better. So I would, uh, we adopt resolution number 06-14, acquiring the property in question. This one's 05. 05, sorry. We don't want you to I'll second that. That will be seconded. Any further discussion? As such big resolution, we would require a roll call vote, and so we call upon the clerk for roll call. Council Member Schwab? No. Council Member Hall? Yes. Councilmember Alta? Yes. Councilmember Ellison? Yes. And Mayor Hodges? Yes. Thank you. Moving on then to item E, Urban County CB, CDBG uh, Program Rental Rehabilitation Program. And CDBG <coughs> is Community Development Block Grant. Correct. I like to clear those things up. Yes. And CDBG is a is Community Development Block Grant. It's a block grant that is, is, uh, comes from the federal government. Um, approved by Congress with all the rules attached to it, the Congress attaches to it, and uh, then it comes to the state, and in this case the county, in the form of federal grant. Um, what you have before you, uh, actually I handed out a different resolution. Um, the, uh, I had sent the original to, to Dick Wendt. Um, we had drafted something internally to get it in the packet to you. Uh, Dick had some changes that he uh, suggested. I'll go over those changes. They're really technical in, in nature. Um, on number one, rather than saying wishes to terminate, it uh, hereby terminates because you don't wish to terminate. You either terminate or you don't. Um, and then the second change is number three on the back. And uh, we really just clarify the, the program, even though Dick was a little confused because he said, how are you terminating per, uh, participation in the CDBG program, yet you're continuing to participate in the whole network program through CDBG. And so we clarify, because I know that that has been, that's been a sticking point um, in this, is um, uh, that, that whole network program, and I'm going to describe it a little more clearly in, in a moment. 
Um, but the, the language change says that the city manager is directed to ensure participation with Holt Network work in the North Kent Transit Services Program through June 30th, 2015. And so it basically is directing you to make sure that we keep that program running for another year, not necessarily with CDBG funds, but in another manner. The program is um, a, a program that where Hope Network provides transportation services for um, persons with disabilities. And uh, there's certain criteria that must be met. There's certain um, income qualifications that, that need to be met. So um, not everybody with a disability is able to use the program within the city of the world. But it does get user, it does get some ridership. And uh, we spend um, anywhere from a little under 3000 to as much as $4,000 um, out of CDBG money for that program. We've talked about it as part of the budget process, and I did set aside $4,000 in the general fund for next year uh, to be able to continue the program for another year. In the meantime, I've been working with Fram, um, the Platte River Outreach Ministries, because they are talking about doing uh, some things that are transportation related, and, and they're interested in, in working on this program and maybe picking it up and you know, maybe talking with the community fund about funding it. So we've got a one-year transition to try to work some of those details out. Um, so that was the change that was made to number three. Um, getting back to the CDBG program itself, um, what the resolution would do is it would terminate our partnership with Kent County um, in the Urban County CDBG program. Kent County receives a direct allocation from uh, Housing and Urban Development from HUD at the federal level. And um, then they take that direct allocation and a portion of it, and it's a small portion of it, but a portion of it, they allocate it out to um, cities, townships, um, to use in low to moderate income areas. So we're restricted in where we can use those funds and um, our restriction, our low to moderate income area is, is basically Valley Vista, Valley Vista neighborhood. And then on the other side of um, M21, um, that the trailer park and then the streets um, surrounding uh, trailer park and, and coming back to the east a little bit. Um, Kent County, uh, there, there has been some discussion within Kent County about uh, whether or not they would continue this CDBG or continue this allocation to cities, villages, and, and, um, and what the future of that might hold. I'm telling you that only because it, it entered into my thinking a little bit in terms of making this recommendation to you. Um, that doesn't mean that it definitely is going to end, um, but it doesn't also mean that, that it will continue, that we will also get the allocation. But there's a lot of focus on regional collaboration and, and funneling, especially from a county standpoint, uh, funneling dollars into projects that have a regional impact. And their discussion has been um, whether or not, uh, rather than just giving a direct allocation to every municipality, um, let's make it more of a competitive process and then you would have to show a regional um, benefit to the project that, that you're proposing. Um, so that's the Kent County side of things. Because we're with Kent County, we do not qualify for CDBG dollars that come to the state and the programs that the state runs. Uh, there are a number of those programs, some of them that are, are similar to Kent County, um, but then that would be available throughout um, the entire city of Lowell. Um, one, of, one program in particular is one that we spent a lot of time talking about and we were this close to bringing to Lowell is the rental rehab program. And what rental rehab does is it um, allows for uh, partial funding up to 75% um, with a cap of $40,000 per unit to convert second and third floor stories of downtown buildings into rental units. And um, again, uh, there are some requirements during uh, the first five years <coughs> The uh, building owner would have to um, make sure they're, they're meeting market rental rates. Uh, the people who are renting have to be in that low to moderate income bracket. Um, not low income, it's, it's moderate income, so it's, it's, it's a little bit higher. Um, 
And we also, just to give you a little bit of history, we had gone through the process of bringing on a third party administrator uh, to help us with this rental rehab program before we uh, were told that because we received Kent County funds, we don't qualify for the program. Uh, with that third party administrator, we uh, held a, a session here, invited building owners. Uh, there was excellent attendance. And uh, what came out of that uh, was um, five very solid building owners who were interested and, and ready to go, um, ready to move forward. Um, there still is interest in moving forward uh, with this project. There are um, a couple of building owners that are ready to go. The others are still very interested. And um, so that was one of the things that I did some due diligence on before, before bringing this resolution to you. Um, but there was great interest in, in, in the program. Um, the third party administrator had also said that he, he's done this in Mason and several other communities, primarily Mason. And uh, he said he literally has not seen the type of synergy um, in, in Wall. He, he's not seen that synergy anywhere else. Um, that there was real excitement about the downtown. There was real excitement about uh, um, the potential to use these buildings that, that we have available to us. Um, so a lot, a lot of positive things about the rental rehab program. Um, we have done some positive things with CDG and with the CDBG dollars that, that we have received. Uh, essentially, what we would be doing is giving up about $30,000 um, that could be used by the city for uh, projects in a limited area um, to uh, opening up uh, the potential for dollars from the state. It's a gamble. I'm not guaranteeing anything. Um, you still have to apply for the funds. It's a competitive process, but potentially opening funds that um, could be used in other areas of the city, and particularly in the downtown area, to try to revitalize downtown. So, I think I've talked enough. I think I've given you. We've been talking about this a lot. I've tried to spell out the, the, the pros and cons of doing this, and uh, ultimately, um, it's come to. We have to notify HUD by May 12, which means. Uh, you would need to take some action tonight, and uh, then I would either notify them or not notify them. Uh, but ultimately, I'm, I'm recommending that we have this direction. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, any questions? Yes. Sure. Oh, okay. um, this is an opt out for three years, right? It's an opt out. Um, the the um, agreement with Kent County is a <coughs> three-year cycle. Okay. Um, so if we didn't opt out, then we would be in again for okay. another three years. Um, I, what I don't know, and, and now that you've asked the question, it's a, it's a good question, and I'm not sure what to check, um, whether or not we could opt back in in a year or two years. I mean, or, in the, or in the next cycle. Or in three sense. years, if none, none of this materializes and it doesn't look prosperous, would we be able to reapply? I, I know we can opt back in. Okay. The, Just the, the time, time frame, I don't know. I know also that Cedar Springs um, had done the same thing many years ago. Mm -hmm. um, it's how they were able to revitalize some of their buildings downtown as they opted out of the Kent County. I think they went five or six years working with, with the state of Reno Rehab and then opted back in. So I, I, I told that. And I do know that we can hop back in. I just don't know exactly the time frames. That was my question. I know it seems like we're giving up a good chunk of money, and we are, but the potential, and I was part of some of the meetings that we had with the people that were interested in, in you know, doing the rental thing with their buildings downtown, and it seemed like it you know, was very promising. So personally, I, I think it's a good, it's a good gamble. Party. Yes. Interest. We have. So you need to say one we, word. <laughs> we haven't addressed it. Um, that was the plan that I reported to you was going to be kicked off on May third. I've been talking with some people, trying to do some initial things, but we we need to have somebody actually take the time to do an actual count of. How many spaces do we have? We know how many spaces we have.
how many do we need for each business? How many would we need for additional um, tenants in the downtown area? And um, that will be a part of the downtown plan that we do this summer. So, you're right, it is, it is absolutely a concern and it's something that we need to address. Um, so the, the say the $27,000 or the $26,000 that we spent in where we spent it, so now we're not going to spend anything in that area? Right. It's just a reallocation of priorities. So. Well, we only spent $26,000 to begin with, so now we're not going to spend nothing, so it's not reallocating, <coughs> it's just not well, it would be, re it would be reallocating to uh, okay. the downtown type of foreign groups. Any other questions? Yeah, yes. just another question, and there was a lot of information, so I may have missed some of it, Mark, but you mentioned here about one concern about what the whole network providing limited transportation. Obviously, that that's part of you know what's not being covered by this money that we're taking away, is that correct? Correct. What other things? If we're taking that away, what else is there? That that is the only ongoing thing. What what we have used the money for in the past has been, excuse me, uh, sidewalk improvements, um, street repairs, uh, um, water water line replacement, um, park improvements, uh, trail the Ridgeview connector trail that we just did. Um, we use CDPG money for that. Um, so we've used it on a number of things in in that area. In that, that neighborhood. Um, so that's that's the twenty six thousand that would be that would not be available to us any longer for those types of projects. But here you're saying that at least for this transportation, you are. It sounds as though it's covered for next year. Mm -hmm. This the transportation piece for those with yes. the It is included in the general fund budget for the next year, and then I'm working with. Front to try to figure out a way to make that a sustainable program that we continue with for, for as long as we can. Thank you. Nothing. All right. Something I did not mention that perhaps is worth mentioning, and, and I don't want to present this to you in in a manner that suggests that this will replace the twenty six thousand dollars because I, I don't think it would. I think it would take a fairly substantial investment. But um, keep in mind that as we improve downtown building, we increase the value of those properties, which increases our tax base, which is you know, a large source of revenue for, for the city. Um, it would be wonderful if we increased it to the point where you know, it totally replaced the 26000 I, I I'm not sure what that will happen. I haven't done the math, but that seems like a lot of investment. Um, but, uh, but that is at least something for you to keep in mind that we are looking at trying to get private building owners to invest in their properties and increase the tax base, which ultimately will help the city. Thanks for that extra input. Any other discussion? Do we have a motion? I move that to, um, we pass resolution 614, terminating participation in the Urban County CDG, CDBG program. <laughs> Oh, second. And moved and seconded to uh, uh, pass this resolution uh, with the CDPG uh, programs. Uh, any other discussion? i just like to note for the record, I'm, I'm for this idea. I guess i just like to make sure that this transportation program continues and it's still a priority. Because I think it's a great idea and I don't want that to be lost in the process. We're great that we're bringing in the economy, but I think we also need to think about those that are challenged by travel. Okay, then. as a resolution, we need a roll call. Call for that. Councilmember Schwab? Yes. Councilmember Hall? Yes. Councilmember Altov? Yes. Councilmember Allison? Yes. And Mayor Hodges? Yes. Thank you. Well, we got then to item eight, uh, council comments, and Councilmember Altov. Um, well, not much has happened since last meeting. Um, the town is starting to look nice, though. Oh. 
everyone has said, or like the library guy has said, um, I do think we need to really work on the west bank of the river. <laughs> we were supposed to do something, and I haven't noticed anything yet, but um, that's all I have for you. Thank you, Councilman Member Schwab. I, I've been out of commission, so I don't have much report on fire authority, but life is good. Ball's ice cream is great, and the sun is out, so. That's all I have. Also, Member Hall. Uh, planning Commission meeting is upcoming, and so is Lara. The only thing I report on is uh, that I covered the TDA meeting for uh, Jeff, and the DDA did pass their annual budget, so. That is moving along, and it's nice to see the library tree is gone. <laughs> no more worries on that one. All right. Ms. Uh, and none of my committees have met. The Arbor Board will be meeting. I know we were going to plan on doing uh, an Arbor Day celebration. We were going to donate some trees to the BP station, and that has been set back a couple weeks because they're just not ready for them. So look for that soon. But. Uh, that's the only update, and I, you know, I hate to say I'm glad the library tree is gone, but I'm glad the safety concern is gone. It's sad to see that tree go, but uh, I'm glad everyone will be safe this summer. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Whole Light and Power will meet uh, later uh, this week, uh, Chamber of Commerce next week. Uh, Book Memorial Fund will meet uh, May 21st at uh, 4 p.m., although there's really no monies to be given away, but uh, that's a discussion that we'll have on uh, May 21st. Uh, Coffee with Council was last Saturday and uh, we were embraced by the uh, wonderful Diane Jones, our uh, Kent County Commissioner, and uh, she sh shared some uh, ideas and thoughts with the uh, Council at that time. And uh, again, Coffee with Council meets the first Saturday of each month uh, between 8 and 10 a.m. at the Chamber of Commerce office. And we thank the Chamber for making that available to us. And with that, we'll move on to Mark Howe and Manager's report. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. I, I have the items in my written report that I'm going to go over, but I have six other items to discuss with you as well, so um, just you know, more information that, that continues to happen. But yes, the, the maple tree is gone. Um, Dan had reported back to me, and I have a few pictures that I can share with you, but um, the, the, the trunk itself at the base was solid. Um, about, uh, I want to say maybe eight, to 10 feet up. Uh, we did save the log out of that. I think we've got a couple logs that we're going to try to figure out, um, you know, whether or not we can do something with, with the wood. Um, but farther up, there was a crack um, in, in the, the main log. Um, and then several of the large branches were hollow and they actually burst, um, which, uh, which I've noted was quite a surprise to the colonies of ants that were living inside. Dan said it, 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 it literally burst and ants were flying out of um, these large limbs. Um, but uh, like I said, we saved a couple of logs. We're going to look into what we can do with those, and, and, and hopefully the tree can last for a very long time in some form or another. Uh, I've been working with Grand Valley Metro Council to ensure that current proposed uh, trails are um, included on motorized land. I think I mentioned this in the strategic calls. Uh, we coordinated a pre-construction meeting with Rockford Construction on the biodigester. Um, Keep in mind, I'll give a construction schedule to you when it is, they, they said that they would forward that to us, but keep in mind the first week of July or so, um, they had said that that's when the, the up flow, down flow uh, tank is going up on the outside, and apparently there's an interesting process for the way that they put that up. Um, so keep that in mind if you want to go take a look at the, that project uh, under construction. Fourth one of the Monday of the month is Memorial Day. We should talk about whether or not we want to schedule a workshop this month. We have a budget workshop this month. Maybe that counts. It's good with me. Okay. I, I was hoping you wouldn't say that you want to come in on Memorial Day if you want to. <laughs> okay, so nothing that way. All right. Um, the, uh, um, the things I have to add, the water plant, um, there is uh, no softening going on. We did put a notice out on the website. I just put it on our Facebook page um, from May 5 until May 26. 
Uh, you'll recall the filters that we had replaced. We brought that project to you, and so those filters are being installed, and so there's no softening of the water going on. Um, Bowes Road, just a quick update. Their uh, milling is was scheduled for um, Tuesday, and they're planning on paving Wednesday or Thursday. So that Bowes Road project is moving along quite quickly. Um, the uh, lime disposal project is completed. All of the lime has been spread. Um, I had indicated I got a, a pay request and I haven't signed it yet because I had indicated that I wanted to see all the Department of Ag paperwork before I actually signed the pay request. Um, I will tell you that I got it this afternoon, thumbed through it uh, um, briefly, and I still have more questions. So um, uh, somebody's going to be answering some questions before we decide to make that last payment. Um, but it's looking good. It's looking like the lime disposal project to this is completed. Um, I wanted to, you know, like we did last week, if it's okay with the council, I've got a couple of updates in terms of union negotiation, and it's really updates again, uh, rather than, you know, we don't need to have strategy discussions, and so I could do that, and, and I've actually prepared uh, a little bit of a PowerPoint for you, because there's a couple of things, tricky things that I want to walk through with you. I'm going to do that in open session, I can do that again. For um, the current status is that on March 24 we submitted a proposal to the IBEW. On April 4, uh, the IBEW rejected our proposal, and they asked us to withdraw permissive subjects of bargaining. Um, since that time, there's been a series of letter identifying what the IB trying to identify what the IBEW feels is permissive and also trying to identify why they feel these subjects are permissive. Um, but in the meantime, we're waiting a counter proposal from them. It's, it's their turn. And uh, it's now been uh, more than 30 days. Um, permissive, I want to, it's, it's a very complex area of the law. Um, there's many, many work cases on it. And uh, there, there are basically mandatory and permissive subjects of bargaining. Mandatory means that those are issues that you must bargain over. Permissive means that the parties must agree to bargain over these issues. Um, so that's my simple, non-legal description of those two things. But understand that there's a lot of case law dealing with what's mandatory, what's permissive. So um, on April 4, we received a letter from uh, the uh, IBEW basically saying the IBEW is requesting the city to withdraw permissive subjects of bargaining contained in, in its March 24, 2014 proposal. And we sent, by the way, there are copies of these letters that I'm going to distribute to the council, and I have an extra packet for you, and they'll be available for everybody who wants copies. Um, so you don't have to take a picture of our screen. Uh, we sent a letter back uh, basically saying, okay, you feel that there are permissive subjects, what are they? Uh, can you give us an itemized list? And can you also give us specific documentation as to why the IBEW is asserting that um, they're permissive subjects? Tell us why you think that these are permissive subjects. They sent a letter back to us saying, well, the items are Article 4, the Grievance Procedure, Article 15, non-bargaining unit personnel, Article 17, subcontracting, and then Article 19, all fringe benefits. So basically they're saying these are items that we believe are permissive subjects and um, they would like us to withdraw our proposals on these topics. Um, they also, as far as the documentation, they said that in their fact-finding briefs, um, that contains some but not all of the available authorities or reasons why they're listing these subjects as permissive. And so we brought, wrote back and we said that you did not identify specifically the authority on which you're basing your request, so we need some time to go through this. We need 30 days. And we said we respond on it before May 30th. Um, Friday, I received a letter uh, 
basically saying that it is difficult to understand the need for three days in which to respond and that the IBW will proceed in the best interest of this bargaining unit. And so that's where we stand. That's the update on that. In the meantime, um, I also received another letter relating to water certifications. And um, in that letter, the IBEW asked that we, turn, we, we return to the status quo, um, allowing employees to obtain requested certifications of, upon approval of the water treatment plant superintendent or the water distribution supervisor. Um, I'm gonna go into a little bit what these certifications mean. Um, it was, this request came to me on March 10 by the water treatment plant superintendent um, asking that employees Todd Phillips and Ralph Brecken take exams for the S2 and the F2 licenses, which are the two highest licenses that we need in each of treatment and distribution. I respond, uh, responded that day, um, I was being asked on the day that the applications needed to be posted on. Um, and I responded, I spent a lot of time reviewing the requirements, uh, reviewing their current licenses, and said that I did not believe that higher licenses were necessary without a discussion among the supervisors of, of our long-term plan for how we were gonna stand water treatment and distribution. Just to give you more information on minimum required certifications, um, the state, this is great coming off from our, our governance tool one session. Um, we have state law, which is the Safe Drinking Water Act, and then administrative rules um, that come from the DEQ that outline or spell out what is the detail of what's required within the Safe Drinking Water Act. And that's what I'm gonna be referring to here are those rules, DEQ rules. We have our city charter that addresses the operation of the utility and then we have a code of ordinances that addresses the operation of the utility as well. But the, uh, within the rules, it says that um, a complete treatment system, which is what we have because uh, primarily the drinks off in the water, um, we could have a, a system that is not a complete system and that would require different levels of certification, but we have a complete system. Um, basically uh, sets the level based on population and based on the <coughs> gallons that you, that, that your um, capacity that you have. We actually are in uh, the population class of an F3, 1,000 to 4,000, and uh, the capacity of 0.5 to 2.0 million gallons, we're, we have a rate of capacity of 1.75. So we're in that technically in that F3 classification. However, before the 2010 census, we were over 4,000 in fact, over 4,000 in population. So we were set at, at a class F2. We could ask the DEQ to lower that classification. We have not done that. I don't know if there was a need to do that, but it's important that you keep in mind that technically, um, even though we're an F2, S2 system, we could be classified as, I think, as an F3 system, and that's a discussion that we would need to have with, with the DEQ and amongst ourselves as to whether or not there's some value to that or not. Um, also within the rules that addresses the distribution systems, and again, with the distribution systems, it's population, and there's that 1,000 to 4,000, and where our population is 3783. Um, as a result of the 2010 census. As I said, we're currently classified as a, an F2, S2 um, under water treatment. Uh, an F2, one person with an F2 license is required, and then we're required to have one designated backup with an F4 or higher. F1 is the highest, and then two, and then three, and four. Um, also, because of our F2 classification, shift operators must have an F4 or higher. In water distribution, an S2 is required, and one designated backup of an S4 is required. Okay. Right now, we, we exceed 
the DEQ requirements. Um, we have the F2, and then not only do we have the minimum F4, but we also have an F3. So we, we exceed those requirements for an F2. In water distribution, we exceed the requirements. We have an S2, and then we have that minimum S4, but we also have an S3. So we exceed those requirements as well. Um, again, I, I, I'm not sure what they're trying to get to when they talk about um, the status quo and who made this decision. Um, I've not gotten into um, how that has been done in the past. I'm sure I'm going to end up having to do that over some time. But again, the city charter is pretty clear that municipally owned or operated utilities except the electric utility are administered as a regular department and they're under the management supervision of the city manager. And uh, your code of ordinances is pretty clear um, in terms of uh, management supervision and control of the city manager. And also that the city manager may employ or designate such persons in such capacity as he deems advisable. So your code of ordinances is pretty clear in terms of it's the manager's responsibility to designate who would obtain which license. Where this goes, I don't know. Um, but I did want you to be aware of the letter. I wanted you to be aware of the certifications. And um, that completes my update. Question about that. What would be the reason to get a higher certification? Is there a pay rate um, difference? Or just, I mean, yeah, why would you be motivated to do that? Is it financial or just? There, there. I, I don't know. I can't. Okay. I can't tell you what other people's motivations are. I can. I can answer your question in terms of the, uh, the pay rate. Okay. I want to carefully choose my words here okay. because this actually was the subject of the ULP that um, the judge on his last day before retiring he had some nice words to say about me um, last fall. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, this was the topic, and it was a topic of whether or not. Um, an individual who had gone to the water plant attain the F4 certification, whether or not uh, he was entitled to a rate increase. Um, what we have had on file are prior written agreements um, between the city manager and specific employees where um, if they attained an F4 certification, they would receive a dollar an hour um, raise, uh, F4 or S4 either side. Mm -hmm. So four would be a dollar, three would be another 75 cents, and two would be another 75 cents. So there are those prior written agreements and that was the subject of that unfair labor practice. Okay. I, I will tell you one of the things that we are, are looking at is that um, those pay increases um, are they, they, they are effective for every single hour and every hour of overtime an employee works, yet they're really an expense to the water fund. Um, but we're not accounting for that as an expense to the water fund. And so we're looking at, and we'll be talking with our auditors about whether or not that should be expensed um, entirely to the water fund, um, even if they work overtime in some other area because it it doesn't seem right that because an employee is making an additional wage but they're plowing streets that the street fund should have to pay for that additional wage as a result of a water certification. So that's that's a discussion we're going to have with the auditors when they come. So there was a lot to consider with that. It's not just there, there, can't there was, make a snap there was a lot. decision yeah. you need some time. And I, and I will tell you my decision was based on what are the DEQ requirements mm -hmm. and and what is, what is our current status? And our current status is that we exceed the requirements. And, and uh, you know, what is, what is our backup plan? I, 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 that was the reason that I said to um, the supervisor um, was that we need to have a discussion about a long-term plan for staffing, treatment, and distribution. And part of that would be what is our backup plan if one of our top uh, certified employees leave for some reason. The 
last item I have on my manager, manager's report is that I did, you were expecting a written report from Dick Wendt. Um, I did get that today. I have that to distribute to you after, after the meeting. So that has been received as well. All right. And that is all I have on the city manager's report. Okay, thank you. Uh, moving on then, this is amazing. There's uh, no uh, vacancies on any of our boards or commissions, uh, so there's no appointments uh, necessary at this time. And with that, and we will adjourn at 8.07. Second. And moved and seconded to adjourn. All in favor? Yes. 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 <coughs> we are. Thank you.